Lydia Tarr is many things. Coming up, a brand new award show celebrating the best movies of the year, according to Patrick Willems. This video is brought to you by Mubi. Get 30 days of great cinema for free at mubi.com slash Patrick H. Willems. All the film fans on YouTube loved the Oscars a lot, but Patrick of the Patrick H. Willems Show did not. Patrick hated the Oscars, the whole award season. Now please don't ask why, no one quite knows the reason. It could be that his favorite flicks had been snubbed, the Academy, he thought, had royally flubbed. Maybe he hated the seat fillers packed in their rows. Maybe his custom Jaws boat shoes were pinching his toes. Emma, what are you doing? I just came up to see if you reconsidered doing the Oscars viewing party episode. Tis the season, after all. No, I don't want to do it. The whole award season always just puts me in a bad mood. I haven't watched the Oscars in 12 years, and I see no reason to change that now. That's when the Patrick got an idea. A terrible, awful patrick Wait, idea. Wait, stop it! Also, how do you know I had an idea? You had that sly smile on your face. Okay, fine, but you don't know it's terrible. I don't like this grinchy light you're painting me in. All right, so what's your idea? Okay, what if we did our own awards ceremony? Showed fans there was a better option. Alternative programming. Patrick narrowed his eyes, looking almost reptilian. We could steal Oscar viewers, maybe even a million. Wait, reptilian? That's just rude. Sorry, I got carried away looking for the rhyme. Man, we gotta get off this roof. It's making everything feel too nefarious. Agreed. It's got big last season vibes. Yeah, let's go. Hello, and welcome back to our show. I know we only just established our new format last episode, but this time, we're changing things up a bit. It is the very end of February, and we are in the height of award season. But as we all know, I'm not the biggest fan of award season. I know, I know, it's a scorching hot take. I'm a movie guy, the Oscars are supposed to be my Super Bowl. Now look, love award shows or hate them, I think most of us can agree on the biggest problems with them. They are way too long, there are too many boring, self-important montages. And, the biggest problem of all, they barely ever give the awards to the movies that actually deserve them. Well, they say if you want something done right, you have to do it yourself. So today, we are going to do our own award show. It will be over in less than an hour, there will only be one self-important montage, and all of the winners are the correct deserving ones. According to me, Patrick Willems, the only audience I actually care about. If you have a problem with my choices, you are welcome to complain in the comments section. I won't actually read them, but Emma will because it's part of her job description. Sorry, Emma. I like to think of YouTube comments as one of the concentric circles of hell. And as for the awards themselves, instead of stylized naked gold men, we will be giving out something much cooler. Funko Pops of Vito Corleone from The Godfather spray-painted gold and mounted on the base of a statue. Plus, he's clothed. As far as I'm aware, this is the only movie award based on an actual Oscar-winning performance. So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Vitos. But before we start throwing shiny gold awards around, I want to take a moment, or five, to reflect on 2022. And by that, I really just mean I want to talk about the movies from last year. In a lot of ways, 2022 was the first normal movie year we'd had in a while. This time, we had actual new movies, not just ones that were supposed to come out two years earlier. And with Top Gun Maverick and Avatar The Way of Water, we had our first year since 2014 where the two biggest movies were neither Marvel or Star Wars. 
Yes, they were still blockbuster sequels, but they were the exceedingly rare kind of blockbuster sequels. They were passion projects by obsessive perfectionist auteurs, James Cameron and Tom Cruise, and each movie spent over a decade in development. Both of them played in theaters continually for months, and they were hits not just because everyone rushed to see them opening weekend out of a sort of cultural obligation, but because people genuinely loved them, and they kept going back again and again and bringing their friends. It was actual word-of-mouth enthusiasm, not just marketing hype. But beyond just these super expensive mainstream blockbusters, what about the rest of the movies last year? Were they any good? Well, in my scientific opinion, it was an okay year for movies. There were a lot of movies I liked, but only a small handful of movies I truly loved, that I walked away from with the holy shit that was amazing rush of adrenaline that I always hoped for. There were several movies that I liked a lot on first viewing, but had the thought, I bet I'll love this if I watch it again. And in some cases, I was right. I think it's always fun to look at a year's worth of movies and try to find patterns or recurring themes or topics to discover what filmmakers seemed to have on their minds. Or at least, what kinds of movies were getting greenlit around the same time. Obviously, there was the string of movies satirizing the ultra-rich. There were all the autobiographical movies, plus the movies about filmmaking and the magic of cinema. And then something that I found interesting is that we finally started getting movies that acknowledged the COVID-19 pandemic. Sure, the majority of movies continued to exist in this alternate reality where there was never any lockdown or mask mandate and the past few years were totally normal. But then you got movies like Steven Soderbergh's Kimmy, where no one really mentions the pandemic, but it's just a part of the world. Tar mentioned it briefly, and Glass Onion was set firmly in 2020 at the height of the global lockdown. So what is there to take from these various developments? Maybe nothing. But it seems to me that many of these projects were born from a time where everyone was taking a moment while the world was shut down and work ceased, a moment when they sat at home and did some reflecting on the state of the world, or their industry, or, in particular, themselves. Okay, before we get going, a quick disclaimer. Uh, try as I might, I was just not able to find the time to watch every single movie I wanted to before making this video. There were a lot of movies. And look, these are movies that I still intend to watch, but sadly, they're not gonna be in the running for our awards. I'm very sorry. So here are the movies that I did not get around to before making this video, and let's have the list scroll up really fast so we don't have to dwell on my failure. Okay, let's kick this off on a fun note. Best song, as in original song. Best song made for a movie in 2022. We had some certified bangers this year, so let's take a look at the nominees. From Marry Me, the title track, Marry Me. From RRR, Natu Natu. From Tar, Apartment for Sale. From Top Gun Maverick, I Ain't Worried. And from White Noise, New Body Roomba. And the veto goes to... It's Natu Natu. Duh. I mean, come on, people. What else was this ever going to be? Natu Natu was literally my most listened to song of 2022 on my Spotify wrapped. It's catchy as hell. It has one of the best musical numbers in cinema history. It is the song of the year, number one with the bullet. Hey, Emma, since no one affiliated with these movies is actually here... Can you accept the award? Should I give a speech or something? No, nah, that's okay. We want to keep this thing as short as we can. Anyway, for our next award, we're sticking with music. But instead of original songs, this time our category is... Best Needle Drop. So the nominees are... From After Sun, Under Pressure. 
from ambulance sailing from barbarian ricky ticky tavi from kimmy sabotage kimmy max volume and from orphan first kill maniac and the veto goes to Sabotage in Kimmy. And yes, I know that After Sun Needle Drop is so emotionally shattering. And also After Sun has another great one uh, with Tender by Blur. But minor spoilers here. When Zoe Kravitz says, Kimmy, play Sabotage. I sat up and cheered while sitting alone in my apartment. It is so good. One of my favorite moments of the year. Moving on. Okay, our next award is something that you won't usually see in award shows, but I think that it's worth spotlighting. So the nominees for Best Character Introduction, as in Best Scene or Moment Introducing a Major Character in 2022, are Barbarian, the introduction of AJ, The Batman, the introduction of The Batman, the Fablemans, the introduction of John Ford, RRR, the introduction of Beam, and Tar, the introduction of Lydia Tar. And the veto goes to Comarum Beam from RRR. Look, it is hard to get a cooler shot with cooler music than this, but then to stand there totally jacked pouring blood over your head to fight a wolf and a tiger. That is an all-timer character intro right there. But now, folks, it's time to talk about acting. This year gave us such a wonderful variety of performances, sometimes even from a single actor. Like, Colin Farrell chewed all the scenery while covered in crazy prosthetics in The Batman, and then he did, like, the opposite of that in After Yang. But both were equally great. So here are my nominees for Best Lead Performance. And we're not going to split this up by gender because it's 2023 and I feel like we've moved beyond that. So anyway, here are the nominees for Best Lead Performance. Kate Blanchett in Tar. Colin Farrell in The Banshees of Inisherin, Jake Gyllenhaal in Ambulance. Rebecca Hall in Resurrection. Paul Meskel in After Sun, Park Ji Min in Return to Seoul, and Tilda Swinton in The Eternal Daughter. And the veto goes to. You know what? Fuck it. They all win. I make the rules here, and I think they're all great, so it's a tie. And now, moving on to supporting performances. They might not have quite as much screen time, but they are just as deserving of shiny gold awards. So the nominees for Best Supporting Performance are Kerry Condon in The Banshees of Inisherin, Colin Farrell in The Batman, Justin Long in Barbarian, Kiki Palmer in Nope, Mark Rylance in Bones and All, Kristen Stewart in Crimes of the Future, and once again, no one can tell me what to do, so I say they all win. Great job, everyone. I could never pick a favorite out of you. But I will say that I wish Kerry Condon was here to accept an award because, you know, she's got a great Tipperary accent and just seems delightful. Her acceptance speeches are always really fun to watch. But alas, we do not have any famous people here with us. Unless... Wait, Emma, are you secretly famous? No, fame is just this corrupting influence that removes any sense of privacy from our lives and creates a dissociative schism between our authentic selves and the avatars of public perception it builds. Uh... okay. My semi-ironic experimental Val Kilmer meme page has been gaining some traction recently, though. I love that for you. Up next! the best action scenes of the year. Now, full disclaimer here, 
There are a handful of movies that I have not yet had the chance to watch that action connoisseurs will probably complain are being left out. Those movies include Lost Bullet 2, Accident Man 2, and The Roundup. And I will get to them, I promise. But we have to accept that this is not a 100% comprehensive list. This is subjective, my opinions, based on what I actually watched in the past year. So anyway, here are the nominees for the best action scene of 2022. Ambulance, the helicopter chase in the LA River. Avatar, the way of water. Payakon, the alien whale, cuts a guy's arm off. Prey, the predator versus the French trappers. RRR, Beam and the army of animals attack the governor's house and Top Gun Maverick, the entire final mission. And the veto goes to Top Gun Maverick. Now, you might say it's kind of cheating to put the entire extended third act action sequence on this list and give it an award, so feel free to complain about it in the comments section, but this is my show, and I say that that is the best piece of extended cinematic action that I saw all year. Actually, that I think I saw it in several years. And I watched it many, many times. Even in Screen X, which I gotta say, was pretty fun. Emma? Anyway, moving on. So now, we get to a category that I truly believe should be in every award show. This is the best animal scene of 2022. This was a great year for animals and movies. We had Dog and EO, two movies all about animals. And I'm sad to say that Jenny the Donkey from Banshees of Inisherin just missed making this list. That's how tough the competition was. And so, the nominees for best animal scene are Avatar, The Way of Water, Payakon the Alien Whale Cuts a Guy's Arm Off, Dog, hiding out in the rainstorm. Eo, the scene where Eo escapes. Everything everywhere all at once. Rakakuni. And RRR, beam and the army of animals attack the governor's house. Okay. And the veto goes to... Apologies to my guy Payakon, but the winner is RRR. I mean, come on. Beam crashes a party full of rich, evil British people and destroys them all with an army of animals. He throws a jaguar at a guy. A deer gores a guy's arm with its antlers. There's a tiger. You can't possibly compete with that. So we talked earlier about how many movies there were that were in some way about filmmaking. So I figured, hey, let's devote a whole category to that. So up next, here are the nominees for Best Scene About Filmmaking in 2022. Babylon, one day of filming silent movies. Also from Babylon, the first day of sound filming. The Fablemans, filming the war movie. Nope, getting the shot of the alien. And X, the farmer's daughter scene. Okay. And the veto goes to Babylon, the first day of sound filming. Now, Babylon is a movie that I am wildly mixed on. Like, I wouldn't even fully say that I liked it, but there are elements of it, like Justin Hurwitz's score or certain scenes, that I have not been able to get out of my head. And this scene, a manic, hilarious, agonizingly stressful day trying to shoot one single shot in a movie, is genuinely one of the best, most truthful portrayals of filmmaking I've ever seen. Hello, college. That was a, a reference to the scene. It makes sense if you've seen it. Anyway, now it's time to get really specific. It's time to look at the nominees for the best individual shot of 2022. From After Sun, the final shot of the movie. From Athena, the opening shot of the movie. The Fablements, also the last shot of the movie. Nope, 
raining blood over the house. And Tar, the one-shot Juilliard masterclass. And the veto goes to... Athena. Now this one is almost sort of unfair because Athena's opening shot is like 10 minutes long and it's one of the most astounding, exhilarating pieces of filmmaking all year. Like it starts with a press conference at a police station, then it turns into a riot, then that turns into a car chase, and by the end of this one single shot, it has escalated into a full-on war movie. Now, we've become desensitized to wonners in recent years because you know, they've gotten easier to pull off with digital technology, but this is one of the most impressive things I think I've ever seen. And it has a real storytelling purpose beyond just showing off. It is incredible. Best shot of the year. So now, let's step it up and talk about the best scene of the year. Some of these are from movies that I would fully consider masterpieces, and some are from movies that I don't actually love, but I love pieces of. And this is the place to celebrate them. So, here are the nominees for the best scene of 2022. Ambulance, the impromptu surgery scene. Athena, the opening 10 minutes. Babylon, the first day of sound filming. The Banshees of Inisharan, talking about niceness. Barbarian, taking out the tape measure. Decision to leave, recreating the climb up the mountain. Elvis, the first performance. The Fablements, the hallway during prom. Nope, Gordy's home. Resurrection, the monologue. RRR, the piggyback prison break. Top Gun Maverick, Maverick proves the mission can be done, and Triangle of Sadness, the captain's dinner. And the veto goes to, yeah, no, no, once again, you guessed it, they are all winners. <sighs> what a good group of scenes. It's a tie. All right, I am having a good time with this, so let's keep it going. More awards. The award for best movie food that I would most like to eat myself. The cheeseburger in the menu. The movie that I most want to see 10 sequels to is... Confess Fletch. The best boots in which pusses are contained... After Yang. Hey, Emma, is it just me, or is, is this going really well? It's not just you. I texted my friend about the show, and she said it sounds, quote, cool, lol. Yeah, like, I know I was dismissive about award shows, but I'm kind of getting into this. I just, I feel like it's missing something. Like, one extra thing that could take it to the next level. Celebrities. That's it. One sec, I'm gonna talk to Dave. All right, you are not gonna believe, no seriously, you're not gonna believe this. Remember that thing I was telling you about with Wendy? Yeah, so, ah shit, can I put you on hold? All right. Hey Patrick, how's the award show going? It's good, it's good. Um, I just feel like it's missing a bit of a celebrity presence. Something to give it some more punch, pizzazz, pop, other P words. Uh, can you get us anyone? Like a celebrity guest? Uh, you know there's proper channels for this, right? Well, yeah, you got Darren that one time. I get it, it's New York, and it seems like you can't throw a rock in this town without hitting a celebrity, but that is not how you get guests. That's how you get sued by Adam Driver. I can maybe get you Robert De Niro. We have the same dentist. Now, Bobby and me haven't really gotten along ever since the Goodfellas premiere. Hi, Bob. Keep your mouth shut. Hi, I mean, don't say one f***ing word, okay? Hi, Sharon Stone made a pass at me that night. Were you wearing the onesie? Yeah. All right, look, the best I can do for you is this. It's the latest add-on to Hypnology. You mean the soundboard? Yep. 
Anytime you need a pop of celebrity, just press this button right here and we'll splice something in. It's kind of like having a celebrity booking agent, except uh, you can actually afford it. Oh God. Well, I mean, the Getty clips aren't exactly free. No, I just realized I left Emma accepting an award 20 minutes ago. I have to go. All right, Adam, you still there? Okay, so he- This award is for all the young people who learned from a courageous group of owls that you don't need to be afraid anymore. Emma? Uh, give it up for Emma, everybody. <clears throat> Thrills, romance, laughs. Over the past 20 years, we've been able to count on one man to deliver these like no one else. In multiple films that push the boundaries of what's possible in cinema, he held a mirror up to our own nature and helped us understand the collective humanity we share. Whether soaring over the water, through a jungle, or down a snow-capped mountain, he reminds us of what storytelling can do and what heroes can be. For our one self-important montage of the broadcast, let's take a look at some of the greatest moments from Xander Cage. What's your name? I'm Triple X. <laughs> I like anything fast enough to do something stupid in the things I'm gonna do for my country. I live for this shit! You've just entered the Xander Zone. I live for this shit. It's gonna take two flushes. My friends call me X. Whoa! Not bad! Gracias, amigo. Welcome to the Xander Zone! The things I do for my country. And now, we're here. The big list. I am going to count down my top 20 favorite movies of 2022. And as much as I was whining at the start about how it was only an okay year for movies, uh, I gotta say, narrowing this down was hard as hell. Like, I only finished ranking these an hour ago. So apologies to all the movies that were left out. Uh, you're welcome to yell at me in the comments section. But let's get to it. Number 20, Mad God. Phil Tippett's deranged stop-motion nightmare that took decades to make is like a hypnotic vision of hell. It is just utterly wild, and I had such a blast with it. Number 19, Triangle of Sadness. In my opinion, this was the best of 2022's satirical takedowns of the ultra-rich, and the centerpiece sequence, with its mass extreme seasickness, is an all-timer. Number 18, EO. This movie is about a donkey, goes on a journey, and I don't know, I guess I love donkeys now. It's lovely and harrowing and also has a surprise Isabelle Huppert. Also, outside of Ambulance, it has the craziest drone shots of any movie all year. Number 17, Armageddon Time. This was James Gray's nostalgic autobiographical movie about growing up in Queens in the 80s and also learning that the world is fucked up and the system is rigged and everything sucks. I thought it was great. Number 16, Barbarian, the breakout horror movie where everyone said, don't read anything about it. And honestly, I am glad I listened to those people because this was truly an experience. It has probably the single best cut of any movie all year. You know the one I'm talking about. And two of the very best needle drops. It just feels great to be really surprised by a horror movie again. So big thumbs up. Number 15, 3,000 Years of Longing. George Miller finally made his follow-up to Fury Road that we've been asking for for years, and then no one went to see it, which is a huge bummer, 
because this movie is excellent. Most of it is just a pointy-eared Idris Elba telling fantastical stories about being a genie. And like, what more could you really want from a movie? Number 14, Ambulance. I was beginning to worry a little bit about Michael Bay these past several years, but boy oh boy, did he show up and deliver his best movie in a decade. Ambulance is a beautiful cacophony of gunfire, car crashes, and a screaming Jake Gyllenhaal, captured with bonkers drone cinematography that feels truly revolutionary. Number 13, Kimmy. Pretty much every year we get a new Steven Soderbergh movie, and nearly every time, it's a banger. But I want to give plenty of credit here to writer David Kep for a killer, ultra-tight, contained thriller script. This is, after all, the same guy who wrote Panic Room, the first Mission Impossible. He knows what he's doing, and look, it already got an award earlier on in the show. This movie rules. Number 12, After Yang. The latest from Koganada quietly slipped out early last year, and honestly, it's one that might have crept up higher on the list if I had had time to rewatch it. It is maybe the quietest, most gentle science fiction movie in years. It's just as much about the memories of an android as it is about Colin Farrell's love of tea. It's great. Number 11, Bones and All. Luca Guadagnino's cannibal coming-of-age road trip movie was not as widely loved as his last couple, but I gotta say, I think it's just as good. It's a moving story about some people trying to make a life for themselves on the fringes of society, but it also builds this amazing American subculture of cannibals that I would gladly watch like five spin-off movies about. And Mark Rylance's character, Sully, will haunt me forever. Okay, and now it's on to the top 10. Number 10, Nope. Jordan Peele's third movie was one that I needed a second viewing to fully click with. It's not giving easy answers, it's putting a lot of strange, maybe disparate elements together, and leaving it up to us to figure out how they all make sense together. It's less overt than, say, Babylon, but it is absolutely a movie about filmmaking, about the lengths we'll go to capture a perfect shot, about the moral compromises we make to deliver spectacle to the audience, and why we're so fascinated by that spectacle in the first place. It's also a western about aliens. Kind of like cowboys and aliens, except like a million times better. Also, Kiki Palmer does the Akira motorcycle slide, and Steven Yun has a monologue about Chris Kattan. It's awesome. Number nine, Return to Soul. Despite the poster having this badass-looking woman in a rad leather jacket lit by neon, this is not actually a futuristic sci-fi action movie. It's really a story of a Korean woman who was raised in France, visiting her birthplace for the first time and looking for her birth parents. And while I wouldn't call this a thriller, the movie is riveting, with so many unexpected turns and multiple time jumps. And at the center of it, there's one of the very best performances I saw all year from first-time actress Park Ji-min playing this tough, thorny character who evolves so much over the course of the movie. And it's actually back in theaters right now, so if you can catch it, I strongly urge you to. Number eight, Avatar The Way of Water. Jimmy C did it again. I can't tell you how nice it felt after 13 years of hearing people say, who cares about Avatar? No one remembers the first movie. We don't want a sequel. To then go in and realize that, oh yeah, no one does this kind of thing better than Cameron, and I will gladly go back to Pandora for as many movies as he wants to make there. What's wild about The Way of Water is that, yes, it is this giant, absurdly expensive action sequel whose reputation is largely built on its astonishing, revolutionary visual effects, but it is also as personal to the filmmaker as any other movie on this list. It's entirely about themes of family, parenting, environmentalism, and of course, the ocean that we all know Cameron is obsessed with. Also, it introduced the world to Pyacon, the alien whale, and for that alone, it deserves a spot on this list. Number seven, 
after Sun. I am a little embarrassed to admit that I did not entirely connect with Charlotte Wells' debut movie on first viewing. It felt a little slight, but honestly, I just probably was not in the right mood for it at the time. And then I watched it again and had a radically different experience. Expressions like quietly devastating get thrown around a lot, but that is exactly what this is. This simple story about a dad and his daughter on vacation is so careful and precise and told with such warmth, demanding that you be fully locked in to register everything that is not being stated outright. And I am not sure if there is a more haunting final image from any movie all year. Number six, Top Gun Maverick. Remember how we all made fun of Harry Styles at that press conference when he said, my favorite thing about this movie is it feels like a movie. Well, you know what? I am gonna steal his silly words and use them to describe Top Gun Maverick because this really does feel like the kind of robust, movie-star-driven action drama that we never really get anymore. The original Top Gun is goofy fun and by no means a great movie, but Maverick takes those characters and that backstory and then weaves them into genuine drama about death and aging and fear. And also, planes going really, really fast. Like, for real, this is not just an incredible feat of aerial photography and cool images. This is a masterclass in clear, suspenseful action storytelling. It's proper clench-the-armrest filmmaking, and just truly kind of a miracle. Side note. If you have not seen Matt Patch's video, Top Gun Shoe, it is maybe the best YouTube video of 2022 and a great companion piece to the movie. Number five, The Eternal Daughter. Joanna Hogg's new sort of autobiographical kind of ghost story came out of nowhere for me. It seemed like it barely even got a release and I've seen no one talking about it, which is silly because everyone should be talking about it. Tilda Swinton plays two of the four characters here in this story about a filmmaker and her mother staying at a hotel together. Huh, apparently this was a big year for quietly devastating movies about daughters and parents at hotels. So it's sort of the souvenir part three, but seen through a gothic horror filter, but really it's less about ghosts than it is about trying to make conversation with your aging mom and hoping that she's happy with what you did with your life. So, terrifying stuff. Number four, The Banshees of Inisherin. The new and, in my opinion, the best film by Martin McDonough feels far closer to his plays than his other movies, which is cool because his plays are fantastic. It is the most deeply Irish thing I have seen in years. Set in this beautiful place, full of people who seem lovely and charming, and it's also packed full of depression, animosity, guilt, and contempt. Colin Farrell suggesting that if Brendan Gleeson is depressed, he should just push it down so as not to bother other people with it, made me laugh harder than any other moment in a movie all year. And it only occurred to me when writing this that Banshees and Eternal Daughter unexpectedly kind of fit together, as they are both partly about people who make the choice to prioritize their creative careers over family and relationships. And as for why those connected with me, I'm not going to interrogate that any further. Anyway, it is now time to give out some trophies for my top three movies of the year. For our third place winner, we have the Bronze Swackhammer, as in the villain from Space Jam voiced by Danny DeVito. And this goes to the Fablemans. I went into Steven Spielberg's autobiographical coming-of-age movie excited, like I am with any Spielberg movie, especially the ones on which he collaborates with Tony Kushner. But I wasn't quite prepared for what The Fablemans ended up being. This is an odd, episodic, sometimes heartbreaking movie that is kind of the opposite of the Movies Are Wonderful Magical Dreams film it was sold as. Yeah, it's about a kid who loves movies, but 
and I'm so sorry to drag superheroes into this, but there's a real Spider-Man, this is my gift, it is my curse vibe to it. As you watch this kid reckon with how his natural ability at this art he loves might also be ruining his life and the lives of his family members. It's pretty incredible. So Spielberg, congrats on your bronze swack hammer. Okay, and now it's time to give out the second place trophy, the Silver Axel Foley. And this goes to... Tar. Tar feels like one of those immediately totemic great dramas that pretty much everyone can agree on. Is it too early to say that Lydia Tar is one of the great characters of the 21st century, up there with, like, Daniel Plainview? She's become a film Twitter meme that has remained funny for months because she is so compelling and so complex and feels like such a fully formed person that you believe she might as well be real. This does feel like the culmination of everything Kate Blanchett has been doing her whole career. It's a nearly three-hour drama that is surprisingly funny, that occasionally turns into a horror movie, that already has wild, dumb theories about how the last act is all a dream, which I can't even really be mad at, because this does feel like the kind of movie we'll be debating and studying for years. So Todd Field, you earned this silver Axel Foley. Congratulations. And now, finally. The Gold Vito Corleone, the prize for my number one movie of 2022, goes to RRR. I mean, guys, come on. What else did you ever think this was going to be? In a year where everyone can't stop talking about maximalist movies, RRR was more maximalist than everything else. In a year when it seemed like every other movie was about the power of cinema, no movie made me believe in the power of cinema like RRR. Yes, this is a straight-down-the-middle, mainstream, crowd-pleasing blockbuster. Yes, it has some potentially problematic politics and some strong nationalistic themes that are justifiably an issue for some people. But I would be a big fat liar if I told you that this was not the movie from 2022 that I had by far the best time with that I spent the most time thinking about and talking about, that I dragged all my friends to the theater to see again and again, because it is just such a singular, incredible experience. So SS Rajamali, congratulations on your gold veto. Now you might be thinking, that's all, that we're finished here. But you would be wrong, because we arrive now at the final and most prestigious award of the evening. This right here is the culmination of what will probably go down as one of the most important nights in cinema history. Our final category is... The best scene of an alien whale cutting a guy's arm off. And the nominees are... Cha-Cha Real Smooth. After Sun, Avatar, The Way of Water, Blonde, The Whale, and the veto goes to Avatar, The Way of Water. Congratulations, Piacon. Ah, and so that's it. Wow, what a year. I gotta say, spending all this time discussing all these movies and scenes and performances and alien space whales, I'm actually starting to think it might have been a pretty good year after all. And while I will get to those remaining 2022 movies that I have not seen yet, I promise, I am relieved now to be done with my obligations. The deadline has passed, so I can watch them at my leisure. And now I can start catching up on the 2023 movies that I'm already behind on. Like, I still need to see Infinity Pool and Knock at the Cabin, and I think there's already another Marvel movie that I'm sort of obligated to see. <sighs> Look, the problem with being a movie fan is you'll never be caught up. There is always so much you need to see, which can also be a good thing. And if you want to catch up on great movies that you might not have seen yet, both new and old, then I think you gotta check out Mubi, our sponsor for this episode. 
Mubi is one of my favorite places to watch movies because it's a streaming platform that is actually curated by human beings who love film, and they want to help you see a huge variety of great cinema from around the world. From iconic directors to emerging auteurs, Mubi always has something new to discover. All of these films are hand-selected, like your own personal film festival. So if you're tired of what most streaming services have, not naming any names, where it's just endless mediocre movies that all look kind of the same, that seem like they were created by an algorithm and you have to search forever to find anything interesting, well, that's what Mubi is for. Okay, this is my favorite part of these ad reads. Uh, part of why I love having Mubi as a sponsor because I just get to browse through the site and see what great stuff they have available right now and then recommend it to you. So obviously a major thing, Mubi is the exclusive distributor for Decision to Leave, the new mystery thriller by Park Chan-wook, the guy who made Old Boy and The Handmaiden. I actually just rewatched it the other night on Mubi and it was nominated for Best Scene earlier in the show. And, ooh, speaking of Park Chan-wook, they have Sympathy for Mr. Vengeance and Lady Vengeance, which are such great movies. And then sticking with South Korean movies, they have Bong Joon-ho's The Host, which is awesome. The director of Parasite doing a monster movie, it rules. Ooh, they have Albert Brooks's Modern Romance, that's so good, uh, Before Midnight. Ooh, they have Sarah Polly's Away From Her, which I actually still need to see that one, so I should get on that. Uh, they have Nicholas Rogue's The Man Who Fell to Earth with David Bowie. They have Deep Red, my favorite Dario Argento movie. Like, it is seriously a masterpiece. Takashi Miike's Ichi the Killer, which, if you have not seen it, is probably one of the most deranged movies that you'll ever see. It is not for the faint of heart, but if you're up for it, I would recommend it. And on a totally different wavelength, they even have Damien Chazelle's first movie, Guy and Madeline on a Park Bench. Look, Mubi is fantastic. I sincerely mean that. I was a fan long before they sponsored the show. And it's not just art house and international movies. They've got horror movies and action movies and Hollywood classics. It's an incredible collection. And you can get 30 days totally free to try it out by going to mubi.com slash Patrick H. Willems. The link right down there in the description. I think you should do it. I really recommend it. That's all. That's our show. Good night. That's a wrap. And correct me if I'm wrong, but it seemed like you had a pretty good time. You know... I kind of did. So does that mean you'll change your stance on the Oscars? No. But this is the part of the story where the Grinch learns his lesson and embraces the thing that he used to hate. Yeah, but that story's about Christmas. Christmas rules. The Oscars are no Christmas. Look, I don't actually hate award season. I don't think the Oscars are terrible. And I'll admit, in a lot of ways, they do kind of have a positive influence. Like, every year, they shine this big mainstream spotlight on movies that otherwise might fly under the radar. Right now, millions of people are watching After Sun and Tar and Women Talking, and that's mostly because of the Oscars. My weird issue is just that I find the whole art as political campaign thing kind of annoying. I find that I enjoy this time of year in movies more if I tune it all out. And wait, are you playing me off? Standard award show etiquette for when speeches get too soapboxy. Okay, look, in simplest terms, award season. Not terrible, just not for me. So, do you want me to throw these in the Gowanus Canal? We should probably stop dumping them there. I think sanitation's on to me. Better make it the Hudson. And we did it. We shot, finished, and released a whole extra video in less than a week since the last one came out, and... <laughs> I'm, I'm so tired. Uh, yeah, we definitely would never be able to do this every single week. Um, but sometimes, you know, you got that deadline that you gotta hit, and you manage to make it happen. Um, anyway, I wanted to fill you in on what's coming up, like, shortly. So there's not going to be 
a video in March, as in not a regular episode on the main channel. There will be Patrick Replies like Q&A videos on the second channel. Um, and this is not because we are slacking off or, you know, like just, just resting and being lazy. Uh, it's because we're taking the time to get ahead on some really big, ambitious videos that are in the works and that need a little bit of extra time. Because we have, we have some stuff coming up that I think is going to be pretty amazing, that I'm very excited about. Like, full disclosure, my goal for 2023 is just for these to be the best film-related videos that anyone makes, um, and to, like, pull out all the stops, you know, like, level up everything, um, get really ambitious, and um, I think we're gonna do it. I'm really excited about it, and I think they'll be cool. Um, the other, Okay, some other stuff that I, I should mention. Uh, if you are not aware, I have the coconut vinyl soundtracks, these beautiful, beautiful things, are in stock and shipping now. If you don't have one yet, get one. Um, also, we recently added new goals to the Patreon, and when we hit 1,700 patrons, and we're getting closer, um, then I will commission someone to build a Muppet Patrick, a Muppet version of me, to appear in the video about Muppet cinema that is coming this year. So if you want me to be a Muppet, that's how you can make it happen. Okay, I think that's all for now. Also, tell us, what should we do with these? We got we got all these awards that I made. Thank you for watching. Um, we'll be back in about a month. Good night.